Voting is not the be all to end all. But what is important for our folks to understand uh, is that unfortunately, uh, what we are not doing is using all of our power over the last several election cycles. Black voter turnout has been down. Look, now we totally understand that because the historic election, uh, the first nation's first black president uh, caused record numbers in 2008 and 2012. Now we're seeing those numbers drop uh, back towards uh, pre-Obama levels. But here's the problem with that. And this is where the percentage of votes that Trump got in 2016 made the difference. When you see black turnout drop, then that actually makes the 8, 10, 12, 14 percent that he got even more important. We're seeing right now, of course, a lot of these white polls talking about he's going to get 20, 23 percent. None of the black polls show that. But the, but the problem that we have to understand is that whether we're talking about Biden versus Trump, whether we're talking about Jeff Landry becoming that MAGA Trump light governor in Louisiana, whether we talk about what's happening in other states, Kemp in Georgia or county level mayors or whatever, when black people are not maximizing our voting power, what we're doing is we are making it possible for folks who do not support our positions, who do not stand with us to then have power and for them to then be able to determine our fate. I made that particular point as the lectures were going on in Louisiana. Activist Gary Chambers was on the show talking about that. Gary posted this, uh, give me one second. Uh, He posted a, a, a series of things on Instagram talking about this very issue. We kept driving this point home and you know what? A bunch of other black media was real silent. And see, so my problem for right now is I don't wanna see these black media people right now doing stories and posting tweets about what's happening uh, in Louisiana if y'all wasn't saying a damn thing before he got elected. And it's a whole bunch of folks out there now complaining about the bills being passed, the power grab uh, that he's involved in. And guess what? They were real silent when it came to trying to get people actually registered to vote. And so what do we now have? We now have a far right wing MAGA Republican who is seizing power because they now have a supermajority in the legislature. And so they can do whatever it is that they want. And so when we talk about these things, what could happen if Trump wins in November? If you think what's happening in Louisiana and Mississippi and Alabama and Florida and Georgia and Arkansas and Tennessee is bad, oh boo, you ain't seen nothing until they take the White House and the United States Senate in November. Joining us right now is Gary Chambers, uh, activist out of Baton Rouge. Also, we have Dr. Robert Biko Baker, a visiting assistant professor at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. Gary, I want to start with you uh, because we have, let's be real clear, we've got ops right now in our community. We've got black people, black people with platforms, with following, who are saying, don't vote, don't vote, don't vote. They ain't done nothing. They ain't done nothing. I had some dude who's a, who's a foundational black American tweeting about, oh yeah, Trump 2024, we're going to make these Democrats pay. And the reality is, and I said, well, that's pretty interesting because you, you say you want reparations. I said, ain't a single Republican out there standing for reparations. I said, everything on your agenda, they are against, but you hollering Trump 2024. And we have to recognize that there are people who are invested in keeping black people from not going to the polls. And when that happens, then we screw ourselves because we're not taking advantage of our power. You know, Roland, you're absolutely right. We have a, it seems like an all out assault from Uh, Some folks in the hip hop and entertainment industry, a lot of influences out there. And when you say don't vote, you tell me that you fundamentally don't understand how the government works, especially if you are somebody who's paying an immense amount of money in taxes. You don't stop paying your taxes, but you're going to tell me that you're going to stop voting. Every time you go to the store, the government takes some of your money. So what you're deciding is that I'm going to let other people decide who spends my money. You're also deciding who's going to determine the 
quirky in schools. You're de- deciding who's going to determine who leads my police department. You're deciding who's going to ter- determine the quality of the libraries in my community, whether or not my potholes get fixed. Uh, there are people who have the privilege of being single issue voters. Uh, I understand the, the terrible genocide that is taking place in Gaza. And there's a lot of folks who are saying, well, I can't vote because President Biden uh, is leading this uh, effort in Gaza as far as the funding goes. Here's the reality. America has never not been bombing other countries. The reality is you just didn't know about it because you weren't tuned into what was taking place with the government that you've been funding. And so now that you're aware, not participating is not the pathway. You can't change the funding if you don't vote for the members of Congress. You can't change the funding if you don't vote for the United States senators. The president of the United States is not the only thing on the ballot. And you're short-sighted, uh, I almost cuss, simple mind individual if you believe that not voting for the president is hurting anybody other than you. You are hurting yourself when you don't participate in the process because you're allowing your enemies to decide who's at the table deciding what's on the menu. I'm not, I have never been in love with the party. I've never been in love with a politician, but I have been in love with black people. And for me, when I look at civil rights, for me, when I look at voting rights, for me, when I look at black investment, uh, investment in uh, black businesses, when I look at investment in black uh, colleges, in fact, uh, there was some fool on Twitter today, I might find it, uh, who actually put out uh, a tweet uh, with a screen grab of the American Rescue Plan saying, uh, see, see what we see, what, see what happened uh, when we voted, because it showed two point seven billion dollars going to HBCUs, but 11 billion going to Hispanic serving institutions. But this person was too stupid to realize that a Hispanic serving institution is any university that has 25 percent or 20 or 25 percent more Hispanics. Texas A&M qualifies. PWIs qualify. So this fool puts out information saying how, oh, we lost out on funding. What he did not post was the $16 billion that HBCUs have gotten over the last three fiscal years. But that's sort of the nonsense that we see. And what these folks don't understand is, and it's crystal clear, these folks don't plan all of the money HBCUs have gotten of the student loan debt relief over the last three years. We talk about investments in black organizations. Also, not only that, under Trump, they were bundling contracts so only in large companies could compete for them. The Biden administration has been unbundling contracts so smaller businesses can qualify. None of that stuff happens if they are back in charge. That's just a fact. Amen. Amen. And when you look at what's happening across the country with community violence interruption, digital equity grants, you know, infrastructure, you can see the Biden plan at work. And my main problem with the Biden administration, they did a very bad job telling the story. We all remember during the Obama administration, the signs, the stories that influences everywhere. Unfortunately, the Biden administration took a little bit too long to warm up. And I, even- actually, I'll be honest with you, Robert. Obama was bad, too. He had to come out and admit that we thought people were going to get it. And it was like, no, bro, you got to sell it. That first bi- that first stimulus bill they passed, they didn't tell anybody. And he was getting nailed. And it was like, dude, you got to sell it. This is Democrats, part of Democrats' problem. As, as Ply has talked about, they don't know how to take credit for stuff. Right. Yes. Amen. I'm not going to debate. You know, we can go back and revisit the Obama administration. There's a lot of things that we should have did differently both as a community and he should have done as a brother, but he was better. He was a much better salesman and they got a very difficult salesman at the top of the ticket. And I think that's why we need to get people like yourselves, you know, out on the road in these battleground states really telling the story. This is a very clear issue. And I know a lot of my people come from the more radical left and we're looking at Palestine and it's a very horrific thing. But I think the even that is clear when you see Nikki Haley in Palestine, you know, riding on bombs and celebrating babies being killed. I think we have a, a really big difference and we have to be honest about where we're at. If not, we could be in a lot of trouble. The, the, the thing here, I, I'm going back to not in love with a party or an individual. And what you have with these ops, Gary, they're out here going, oh, uh, 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 you, uh, you uh, uh, butter biscuits, uh, uh, you dancing, you tap dancing, and all this sort of stuff. And I'm sitting here going, no, I know what the hell I'm talking about. Because federal, state, county, city, school board, 
Right now in Houston, the largest school district in Texas, majority minority, folk are pissed off that, that Mike Miles is controlling the process because the Republican in, Republicans in Austin took over the legislature. Well, guess what happens? When we don't vote in statewide elections, they have that power. In Louisiana, the reason they are running roughshod, they just voted to give the governor power over every state uh, task force and committee, some 148 different uh, boards, because they now have a supermajority. If they don't have a supermajority, they got to work with Democrats. Supermajority, they can do what the hell they want to do, and they are moving fast to completely dismantle and uh, uh, seize power for the next 100 years in Louisiana. You know, the, the reality rolling is because people don't understand the power that they have in their vote. Not participating in the process is how Jeff Landry became the governor. This is a man who won an election with 30 something percent of the people in the state showing up to vote. He won 50 plus percent of that vote, which was about 19 percent of registered voters. 19 percent of registered voters is less than uh, 20 percent. I think it's less than 15 percent of the total population of the state decided who the governor is because people just didn't go to vote. When you don't vote, you give other people permission to make decisions on your behalf. When you don't vote, you allow your enemies at the table for you. More importantly, you give the ability to say that everything that you are working for in your community is not of the same value as somebody else. If you don't understand the process, just say that, but don't sit here and say that people aren't doing anything. If you're frustrated with the speed of the process, just say that, but don't say that people aren't doing anything. I don't believe in blind loyalty, and I'm not one of the people that gets invited to the White House. So when I tell you to vote, I'm telling you to vote because you need to vote for yourself, for your kids, for your grandma and them, because at the end of the day, these people are taking your health care. They're putting your kids records online. They're now stripping away. They're giving a law right now in Louisiana that you got to be 25 percent. Uh, feet away from the police officer if you're filming them when they're brutalizing you. So the question is, uh, does the cop have the tape measure or do I to determine how far we are from the police officer? The, the governor is going to pick the chairman of the board of every state college and institution in the state. He's going to pick the chair of the board for every uh, board that's in the state. Why does one man need to have the ability to appoint the chair of the board if you appoint the, the members of all of these boards in the first place? Because I want to control what's on the agenda of every meeting in every uh, corridor of the state of Indiana. And if you got anything on there about diversity and inclusion, if you got anything in there about equity, I don't want you there. And that's because you just decided you couldn't go around the corner five minutes from your house and click some buttons in a machine to make sure that somebody was there to defend you and your family. Here's a th reason why I, this really jumped out at me. Uh, and that is uh, when, when I look at uh, various polling. Now, first of all, again, uh, I, I understand a lot of these polls in terms of how some of these are. Uh, and so this was a story that was in the heel. Share of black Americans planning to vote drops. Uh, and it says fewer black Americans are certain they will vote in this year's election than in 2020. Only 62 percent of black voters say they are absolutely certain they will vote in November, which is a, a drop from 12 point 2020. Now, first of all, this is this is May. It doesn't mean the number is not going to go up. The issue that I have is, and again, I totally understand people's concerns. I absolutely understand genocide, Israel and Gaza. I totally understand people who say they wanted the George Floyd Justice Act. Uh, they, they wanted uh, uh, voting rights legislation. I understand all of those things. But here's what I also know. Republicans, if they get control, if they control the House, the Senate and the White House, Every single one of those five million Americans who got student loan debt relief, they're going to roll that back. I absolutely know, and it's guaranteed, Donald Trump has already said, y'all find me the soundbite, he has already said, oh, we're going to let cops do their jobs. We're going to grant them blanket immunity. That's going to happen. You have right now 10 Patterns and practices investigations, Robert, with the Department of Justice against police departments. They have been putting prison wardens, jailers, corrections officers in prison for brutalizing inmates, many of them African-American. They have been shutting down banks and others redlining black communities. 
None of those things will happen under a Trump Republican Department of Justice. And so if you was thinking about sitting on the couch, better understand you're going to be real pissed off when another black man gets shot and killed by a cop and you don't have a federal investigation. You're going to be real pissed off when funding dries up for HBCUs. And then you're going to be like a lot of the black folks in Louisiana complaining on social media when they could do something about it. Man, I, I, I just got to, I got to say amen again twice in the same episode. And so, you know, I, yesterday I was watching your old, your old network and brother Tim Scott was on there talking about jobs and justice. And he was saying justice, getting rid of the FBI and Department of Justice. And it's, it's mind blowing in the context of Shelby versus Holder and their gutting of the Voting Rights Act and what they've done to make it harder for people all across the country. Now, if all this is going on and they didn't make it harder and they didn't have these tapes of Donald Trump having the saying the N-word, hey, maybe the Republicans would be a good opportunity for us. But it's not. You know, we're being pandered to. We're being lied to. And unfortunately, the algorithms, Facebook and Instagram, they're lifting up people like Wo Vicky or King Garcia or academics, you know, these bloggers who have absolutely no you know, relevance in the political sphere and they're making them, their messages hit our youth. And so they're being confused. And even my own son who's pretty smart. Yesterday I said, you see, they got Trump. And he said, oh, you know, all politicians are like that. You know, and that's unfortunate. And because our people have so much misinformation. And so hopefully we can do more to get your voice amplified in the in the battleground states. Niambi, this is a piece for the Brookings Institution. It says here, new voter turnout data from 2022 shows some surprises, including lower turnout for youth, women and black Americans in some states. Robert is right there in Milwaukee. Here's a fact. 50,000 fewer people voted in Milwaukee in 2022 than 2018. If those 50,000 people in Milwaukee vote, and we know typically how they vote there, Mandela Barnes is a United States Senator and not MAGA Rob Johns, Ron Johnson. Now, I've been real clear, Mandela Barnes ain't been happy with me. His campaign should have done more. His campaign didn't do what they were supposed to do, but what I'm saying to black folks in Milwaukee, we can't wait on somebody's campaign. The fact of the matter is, black folks in Milwaukee would have been better served with a Mandela Barnes as a U.S. Senator than a Ron Johnson as a United States Senator because he was one of the January 6th co-conspirators. Mm-hmm. And I think you're, you're, you and your guests have been exactly right, Roland. This idea that we have to be in love with candidates or parties, we need to make practical choices. And we are all constrained because the truth of the matter is whether those 50,000 people show up or not, somebody is going to win this election. And to your point, it's probably not the person you want. And it makes me think of what Jesse Jackson said when he ran in 84, when he was at Tinley uh, Baptist in Philadelphia. He said Ronald Reagan won by the margin of despair. And I think we're seeing something similar are happening, not just in Milwaukee, you can think about the Miamis, the Atlantas, the Durhams, the DCs, all of these places where you have people who are disaffected. And like you said, I get the frustration, but politics in and of itself is meant to frustrate. It's not supposed to change quickly. That's the point. But when you think about everything that is at stake, we have to be real clear. We got to make the best decisions we can with the limited options we have. The options aren't going to change. The political system isn't going to change. And keeping our votes to ourselves just might mean we won't have a vote the next time because these people are very clear about what they're trying to do. They've already done it in some places, but they're going to do it in other places. They are trying to destroy our communities. They're trying to destroy progress. They're taking away our citizenship rights. They want us to be... Um, what America used to be. They're not whistling Dixie on this. This is a real decision that they've been making and they have been doing it since the civil rights movement. They have been working on this. You know how dogged and determined you have to be to wait for 60 years to do this kind of stuff or to be planning for 60 years to Mm -hmm. do this kind of stuff. And they finally got their foot in the door. And you better know that if Donald Trump gets in again, Clarence Thomas, Justice Alito going to step right on down. He's going to stack the lower courts. And then we're not going to mention all of the departments that he said he wants to get uh, destroyed. Then you got to think about the people that are coming into governor's offices, into city councils, into school boards who want to restrict our education and keep us learning from Tulsa and all of these other things that are important to us. I mean, these people have a plan for what this life is going to be, and it does not include black people's well-being. You know, it really drives me crazy, Jolanda, when I hear these dumbasses say, man, those scare tactics won't work for us. Earlier, you talked about 
uh, they that Trump wins, Republicans win, they will appoint two new Supreme Court judges. Alito and Thomas right. will step down. Yeah. But we already see what happened with the, with the last three. The reality mm-hmm. is Biden Harris gets reelected, then they got to try to hold on, and they try to re- step down. Democrats get to appoint two. You already got three progressive judges. That would give Democrats the majority on the Supreme Court. Now, all of a sudden, you're talking about changing laws. I'm from Texas. You're there in Texas. Uh, for folk out there, again, who want to play these games, uh, who don't quite understand what America will be like if uh, Republicans control the House, the Senate, and the White House, just go ahead and let them know the hell you got to deal with in the legislature or Republicans control the House, control the Senate, control the governor's mansion, and they're just running roughshod and they control the state Supreme Court and they control all state oppositions, what, all what the Texas looks appeal. like. And all the courts of appeal. So it's very, very, very difficult. We go in, we, the Republicans have a majority in all the branches of government. So Democrats very rarely are able to get bills out of the House to get to the Senate. When we do get bills from the House to the Senate, the Senate is overwhelmingly Republican. They vote down all of our stuff. And then the governor goes and he signs all of this anti-black stuff. So I'm talking about black people. And Roland, I want to say this really quickly. I'm really thankful that you have this station because the mainstream media is whitewashed and they don't tell the truth. But I think that what we need to be as black electeds is we need to go into our communities and we need to connect the dots for them. People, real people that are struggling. I, the way I grew, we have lights. We didn't have water. We got uh, evicted all the time. My mother was trying to figure out how, how she was going to pay the rent, how she was going to pay the car note, how she was going to fix her broke car. So my mother wasn't paying attention to that stuff. And of course, we were worried about how we ate. So what's and also Roland, there are digital divides. So some people who are poor don't have access to the internet. I say that to say this, when you're struggling, you're worried about the thing you can't pay or the thing that's keeping you down right now. We as elected officials have to go and we have to speak to people and connect the dots for them. Like you're mad that they've taken over HISD. Well, we need to have more state representatives and more state senators and a governor who appreciate public education. So you can't miss that election or you don't like you know, what they're doing in a school or how much they're paying. Well, you need to go to the school board. People don't know that. And I'm ashamed to say that when I ran for office and when I was 37 years old, I'm about to be 59. But when I was 37, I didn't know there was early vote. So a lot of people don't vote early, Roland, because they don't know there's early vote. And I was a lawyer by then. So we that know the system, we've got to go talk to people. And we also need for local electeds. To, to go and talk to the people because they're around us. But one thing I'll say, and, and let me be clear, I'm a Democrat and I'm voting Democratic, but I'm challenging the Democratic Party in Harris County and in Texas to do better by black people. You were the only media initially who, who followed that the Harris County Democratic Party, led by white men, were trying to remove black women from the ballot who are running for judge. So we can't get media to cover these stories. They don't want to do that. We've got the same problem here with pride. Pride, which I happen to be the first openly gay person in the Texas legislature, it finally has black people on it. Well, a white group is coming. They're trying to take pride back. The mainstream media won't cover it. And so what I'm saying to you is the people that are in the trenches where they are need to go and explain to their constituents because we're proximate to them. We're close to them because some people are just struggling so hard. And I think that we have time, Roland. That's what I'm excited about. We have time. It's what May. It's going to be June. So we can go out and we can make a commitment. The elected, but we have, we have things that we can talk about. We can come to you. We you know you'll talk about it, but it's 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 way more complicated than we think. But we cannot speak over struggling people's heads. We've got to connect the dots for them. Otherwise, we're, we are going to be apathetic and we're just tired. And the thing here, uh, and I appreciate talking about in terms of the role of the show here. Uh, it, this I, and I love these fools. I love these fools. Man, you sitting here begging for the money. Guess what? Let me be real clear. The political advertising money that we got in 2020, that paid for the staff for the first six months of 2021. 
because advertising right. dropped. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, all y'all fools who talking all this mess, Sinclair, right wing Sinclair, after the 2022 election, announced they made $314 million off of political advertising. And for all y'all folk who run y'all miles town by, uh, man, you just, you trying to beg for dollars. Understand this here. Every media company in America, mm-hmm. Fox, CNN, MSNBC, NBC, ABC, CBS, Salem Radio, Westwood, Cumulus, iHeartRadio, Urban One, Radio One, every single media company projects they're going to make 30 to 40 percent more money in an election year because of political ads. And that's going that's going to handle their budgets in the first two quarters of the following year. And so you can't on one hand go, man, we got to do for self when the reality is this here. If we're able to get two, three million in advertising, that's more than our fan base is giving. And that keeps me from having to keep begging folk to give because they should be advertising on this platform just like they do on all the other networks. We talked about connecting the dots and that's what all this is about. Rob, I'm going to come back to you before I go to uh, before I go uh, to Michael. Here's the thing. And for the folk who don't understand, Robert, you're there and you're there in Milwaukee. What who is more likely to meet with and communicate with black people in Milwaukee? Would it have been a Senator Mandela Barnes and his staff or Ron Johnson and his staff? I mean, that's that's a no brainer. You know, salute to Mandela Barnes. And we, you have me on right after the election. And I have my own problems with the way he ran his campaign. But that's a no brainer. Mandela is still out in the community. And I just saw him at an event with uh, Vice President uh, Kamala Harris. And he was there smiling and shaking hands. So that's a no brainer. Well, no, no, no. no, no the, reason I, the reason I'm asking the question, because part of this thing that I need people to understand is, is that po- a lot of the issue with politics, Michael, is access. One, right. can you even get them on the phone? Two, mm-hmm. can you even get a meeting? Three, can you get a meeting to make demands? It's one thing to say, we want this, this, this. It's something else when they don't even return your phone calls. Right? You just had a runoff in Texas. Dan Phelan, who's the Speaker of the House, got reelected. The Republicans said the only reason he won the runoff because Democrats crossed over it doesn't matter if he went, he, they are his constituents. But the way Republicans operate, they operate is, oh, we don't even talk to Democrats. So I'm trying to tell our folk, this is why we can understand who's in power. Yeah, and, and that, that last word that you mentioned, Roland, is key, power. And this is what I've explained a number of times on this show. We have to explain to our people that you don't vote for exercise, you vote for power. You vote for policies that are beneficial to the you, your community, your people, policies that are good for African-Americans or good for America in general. You have to look at why Republicans work so hard to suppress our vote. Why Shelby County versus uh, Holder U.S. Supreme Court case 2013 was, was filed? Because they've been trying to repeal or weaken the Voting Rights Act since 1965. OK, um, and then we then when we look at uh, those who are in support of a ceasefire in Palestine and they're saying they're not going to vote for Joe Biden, they're going to go do something stupid like vote uncommitted. Well, if you listen to Donald Trump, Donald Trump said he will cut off all humanitarian aid to Palestine. Number one. Number two, when he was in power, when he was in office, he banned Muslims coming from seven countries. Three. Uh, Netanyahu wants Trump in office as opposed to Biden because he knows Trump will allow him to do whatever he wants to do. So we have to understand consequences. And uh, I wanted the two brothers just to talk about how they explain to people on the ground, how they connect policy to conditions, because a lot of this is disconnected from us. We hear these different laws. We hear policies. We hear American Rescue Plan, things like this. But if you can just give us one, if you don't mind, one or two examples of how you connect actual policies in existence, in existence to conditions to connect the dots for people. Gary, you first. 
one of the one of the things that I've thought is critical is that, you know, if you are not having conversations with the people that are running in your local community about what's taking place, then you can't expect those people to deliver on something that you're not putting a demand on. Uh, we're expecting people to come into our communities and do things that we haven't even asked for. When I first got into advocacy, there wasn't an emergency room close to my home because we, the previous governor, Bobby Jindal, closed hospitals in the state because he privatized health care. Black folks right. helped elect John Bell Edwards that expanded Medicaid expansion, and then we put a demand on it that we wanted an emergency room. Now there's an, a, a $10 million investment after the term of John Bell Edwards where an emergency room was in, is within two Two miles of my home. When you talk about police policy, after Alton Sterling was killed, we had a mayor in our city who was ignoring the calls of the community to change police policy. I don't know how many times I've come on Roland's show and talked about the advancement and the things that we've changed as a result of making Mayor Sharon Weston Broom the mayor. Uh, matter of fact, we had the chief uh, go viral because he was challenging the city council about the things that he was doing to hold police officers accountable in Baton Rouge. That doesn't happen if we don't elect the mayor and we're not involved in the conversation. And so some people are just being too short-sighted and looking at what's making you angry. That's making an emotional decision. Voting is a right. business decision. This is a business decision. Every day we go in the ballot box and vote, that's to do business on behalf of our community, business on behalf of our family, and business on behalf of the future generations that cannot vote right now because there were people who went and voted so that we could have the liberties that we have today. There's a quote that my grandfather used to talk about. Uh, we uh, strong men make good times, uh, good, good times, uh, make strong men make good times, uh, and good times make weak men, weak men make bad times. Too many people are being weak in their decision making, and we are producing bad times for the future of our children if we're not doing our responsibility and showing up. Um, Robert, the thing that, uh, that is jumping out at me again, as, as we're having this conversation, um, and, and again, I, I love it when the haters start talking because my parents are watching. So I had, I had the opportunity as somebody who was 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, all the way up to now I'm 55, <clears throat> to be able to see two folk who never went to college, two folk who never made more than $50,000 combined, work with others to create a neighborhood civic club in Clinton Park in Houston. And I watched as these folk, a handful of people, most of them, none of them went to school, went to, went got, went to college, talk about what they wanted in their neighborhood. But here's what they had to then do. They had to then go, okay, well, if we want some overgrown lots cut, and we want some crack houses, abandoned crack houses torn down, that's government. We got to go to government to get it done. Then they were like, well, you know what? We need some new sewer systems and sidewalks and street lights and the park refurbished. That's government. That took place through a bond election. They were concerned about security in the neighborhood. So what did they do? They said they went and met with the police commander. They didn't go yell to the city council person. Who was the commander over the area where we lived and, had, and knew him on a first name basis? I remember it was a little, little young white cop. Uh, my brother, uh, he was at Texas A&M. He was a freshman. I was a senior at Jack Hayes High School. And they stopped by our house from a choir event in Beaumont and they were lying in the street. When well, a cop decided to come down, <laughs> blaring his uh, horn, tell them to move their car, said a uh, 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 fire truck couldn't get down. It was crazy. So uh, my dad was pissed off. Uh, and uh, they called the commander, called the, co I need everybody listening, called the commander and had that cop come back to our house to apologize. That doesn't happen if you don't understand how government works. Now, imagine if my parents didn't vote. Imagine if the folk in the neighborhood club didn't vote. Ain't nobody taking their phone calls. Ain't nobody listening to them. And so part of the point about mobilizing and organizing is when a group of folks show up at your office and you have organized a civic club, 
The first thing a politician, city councilman, school board member, state representative, state senator, governor, member of Congress, U.S. senator, the first thing they think is these folk vote. And when voters show up, they, are, they get responses. But when all folk do is whine, complain, and never show up, that's when they ignore you. Man, what you're talking about, sir, is black power, you know, and uh, we live at we're living on the shoulders of giants. And unfortunately, you know, many of us have integrated into this burning house and really have given up our blackness. And what that does <laughs> is it allows us to be politically weak so that because we don't have an agenda. And so many young people, what we're really talking about is a young thing because the ops are in the young people's ear on social media so much. It's coming through so many channels and I feel bad for them. But we're living on the shoulders of giants. And if our elders fought for this, why can we why would we even think about giving it up? Because some guy went to prison? That's 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 sort of insane. And I don't think that young people really think like that. They're funny, they're ironic. Unfortunately, they we have to put our arms around our babies and, and really raise them up. Because if not, they are gonna be deciding a future that they don't want. Robert Biko Baker, I appreciate it, brother. Uh, hopefully, um, we will get the resources needed, uh, and I hope to bring the show to Milwaukee uh, to broadcast from there to do a town hall. Trust me, it's on my list. Uh, I mean, I, my, my, my goal is to come to go to Milwaukee, is to go to places in Michigan, go to places in North Carolina, go to places in Georgia, uh, because, and, and to convene, do the show, but to have these mini town halls, if you will, hearing from the people, uh, because, and I, and I keep telling everybody, and this ain't hating against nobody, ain't no other black-owned media outlet doing this. Come on now, we need you. Just let right. folks know that. So, Robert, I appreciate it. Thank you so very much. Um, Niambi, I want to go, go back to you. This is the thing, Gary, stay right there. Niambi, the, the thing that, why this is so important is because I believe, and I have said this numerous times, I've said this to the Biden campaign, I've said this to Senator Chuck Schumer, I've said to all these folk, that I, and I said this last year, first of all, I said that Biden Harris should have started re-election the day after the inauguration. That was one. So I think they started too damn late. Two, I say the beginning in January, they should have been doing this, going to these cities and having different surrogates and not just them having black mayors, Randall Woodford in uh, Birmingham, having Mayor Andre Dickens in Atlanta, having uh, the mayor of Arkansas, having the mayor, uh, former mayor Sylvester Turner in Houston. They should be doing these conversations in these towns Again, inviting someone like us in to live stream that and answering people's questions. If people say, well, I don't know what they've done on this. Boom, we got the answer for you. What about this? And because I believe that January to August was what I call the in education and inf informative stage. Then when you go August, September, you're trying to get folks registered. September, October, November, you're trying to get them to vote. It moves in stages. So Vice President Kamala Harris, she's done some of this on reproductive rights, on economics. But no, you got to be fanning out across the country having these type of conversations because I can't get somebody interested to register if I don't educate them, but they can't vote unless they registered. Exactly. And you have to do this in many places a month in advance of the election. So if you decide on the day of, hey, my mind has changed and you don't live in a place with same day registration, it's USOL. Right. So I think you're exactly right. And I feel like we're it's a little bit of Groundhog Day because I feel like we've had shades of this conversation before, which is part of the reason you feel some of this resentment in our communities. It's like you only come around when you need our votes. Where are you in the in-between time when the election isn't raging? How do you communicate to us? How do we know what you're doing? Even something in the mail to say, hey, this happened for you. Did you know you know, if you're a homeowner and you just replaced your water heater, that you can get a tax, um, you know, abatement for that. I mean, that's something real. That's something tangible. I had my student loans forgiven. I've known so many black professional people who've had their student loans forgiven. Where's that conversation? Right. Um, how do you not go to these places where black people are and just 
talk to them. And it won't be easy conversations. There are people who are still pissed about the George Floyd Act. There are people who are still pissed about voting rights, who have real concerns about the economy. So these are not going to be easy conversations, but I think people would respect it a lot more if you had it and didn't just come begging hat in hand, as you said, when it's almost too late, because we've already had primaries in many places. Yep. So now all that's left is the general. And you know that's a big ramp up. And it can't just be about the convention because voting happens at the local level, neighborhoods, communities. Yep. And these people seem to forget that black people are like everybody else. We want to be courted. We want to be told we're pretty. We want to be told we're valuable. And we want to be shown that every day. And if you can't make policy happen because you have an obstructionist Congress like what you have right now, then you need to communicate that to people and tell us what you're doing to remedy that and get around it. This is the thing that jumps out at me, uh, Gary, when we're talking about um, mobilizing and organizing and what has been done. And again, this is how I operate. I operate in facts. If Donald Trump and the Republicans poured $16 billion into HBCUs, I would be saying that's the largest investment in HBCUs ever. It's a fact, but it's not a fact. So when Senator Tim Scott goes on TV lying what he does not say is that the two, and, and they love touting this $250 million program, but first of all, Trump zeroed that out of his budget. It was Congresswoman Alma Adams who put it back in. That's how it got passed, and Trump takes credit for something his budget folk want to get rid of. That's a fact. If the Republicans had appointed 58 black judges out of the 237 Trump appointed, I would be saying they appointed the most black judges of any president in history. They didn't. Of the 237 judges Trump appointed, 4% of those judges were black. Fact, Biden, uh, Biden Harris, they appointed, they appointed uh, 200 federal judges so far. Go to my iPad. 58 of them are black. 37 black women, 21 black men, and every one of you punk ass brothers out there who's been talking shit, oh, he appointed more black women than black men, that's because previous presidents appointed more black men than black women. For folk who don't understand facts. And so this is where, it, when somebody comes at me, I'm just answering with fact. And the fact of the matter is, if Biden Harris has done this in student loans, this in HBCUs, this in fund. I'm gonna lay it all out and I'm gonna compare it to what Trump has done. To me, this is an easy ass vote. It's not difficult at all. You know, you don't have to be uh, a chief spokesperson for Joe Biden to do what's in your best interest. And I think that, you know, there's a host of things that we can complain about with the Biden administration, but we also have to be honest. When you look at uh, the stabilization of what he did after COVID, uh, because Donald Trump left us in a mess while a bunch of your grandmothers were sick or dead as a result of COVID and the pandemic, when you look at the ability to pass uh, the infrastructure plan, the reality is government is like a big boat, not a speed ship, uh, not a speed boat. Uh, you want government to respond and turn in mechanisms that it doesn't happen in. It takes a year to two years before you start to see the impact of some of these policies. And when you see those policies, what will happen if we don't show up is all of the work that was made over the last four years will be for nothing because they'll come in and undo it all. They've already got their plan. They've already got their people in place that they want to put in to execute their plan. While you are sitting there making emotional decisions, people are being strategic about what they are going to do with your reason. So the question really is, are you going to do what is in your best interest or are you going to make an emotional decision? Joe's old, Joe's slow, Joe doesn't communicate as well. You'd like him to uh, to communicate. Joe is uh, funding the genocide. We know all of these things. Donald Trump is worse every day of the week. 
every day of the week he's worse. And the people that he's going to put in power, this is where it really gets tricky. I'm from Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and I know how many people that are competent from the state of Louisiana that are leading in the U.S. Congress and leading in this White House to make a difference for black people because of people in key positions that Joe Biden listens to. I may not agree with those people, but I understand the impact of the work being done on behalf of black people. When you put Donald in there, a lot of those competent, educated, qualified black people who are in there doing things on your behalf, they're no longer going to be there, and they're going to be people there that are unqualified, incompetent, on working on your behalf to your detriment every single day. Uh, joining us right now uh, is Kadita Kenner. She is founding CEO of the New Pennsylvania Project. Kadita, here's what's very interesting. I, I have seen some of these uh, clueless damn rappers uh, talk about, man, the hood said our pockets were full when Trump was president. Look about them stimmy checks. Uh, Henry, go to my iPad. This right here is what is called the American Rescue Plan. It was passed under President Biden. And look at this here. When it goes, here's the help with the American Rescue Plan. I need help finding a vaccine. I need help getting health care coverage. I need help buying food. I have kids. I need help with rent. I lost my job. I need help getting a rescue payment. I want to offer my employees paid off of vaccines. My small business needs help. Oh, I'm sorry. Did somebody actually say stimulus checks? Does anybody remember under Biden Harris $1,400 checks that actually went out to folks? The problem is, Kadita, he didn't put his name on the checks like Trump did because he wasn't trying to be so narcissistic and taking credit. And so, again, these folks are running out here, first of all, forgetting we were in a 100 year pandemic where they were providing uh, insurance, things along those lines. And all these folks who think these checks are going to start flowing if Trump gets back. Project 2025, they plan on cutting everything. And all y'all folks out there who are pissed off that your, that your uh, taxes are higher, that was a part of the Trump tax cut where your taxes went up in 2024, 2025, and they want to make the Trump tax cuts for the rich permanent next year. Absolutely. And that's what we're dealing with right now is overcoming the misinformation and the disinformation. I can't tell you how many people were coming across here in Pennsylvania on the ground who have no idea who was actually responsible for these pandemic checks. And as you mentioned, because his name was written in the, in the letter that came and closed with the check, multiple people believe that it was Donald Trump um, that was responsible for these pandemic checks. And so we are spending so much time on the ground right now trying to overcome the misinformation and the disinformation. We can't get to the prime a purpose of our work, which is to do voter registration here in Pennsylvania and turn out black folks to vote. We have to overcome the misinformation that is keeping folks from wanting to be registered to vote. And I'm here to tell you today, as an organization that has registered 40,000 Pennsylvanians to vote in the last two years, we have people who are registering to vote who choose not to be aligned with any political party because they're not sure of who does what and when. Uh, last year, it was 17 percent of the folks we were registering to vote uh, register is unaligned, uh, not choosing to belong to the Democrats or the Republicans. This year, that number has gone up 11 points to 28 percent of those we are registering here in Pennsylvania choosing to be unaligned from political parties. And mostly because they don't know who the Democrat is who the Republican is, civics have been taken from out of their public school systems. Um, and so we're having to provide all the civic education on the ground. At the same time, we're trying to get folks registered to vote and turn them out. And I'm just, and again, for all the folks who sitting there saying, man, you sitting there caping. No, I'm stating facts. These right here, what I'm about to read, are actual facts that were in the American Rescue Plan put forth by Biden Harris. American Rescue Plan increased the, <coughs> the earned income tax credit from $543 to $1,502. That's almost $1,000. Also, those with children, they increased the child tax credit from $2,000 per child to $3,000 per child for children over the age of six and $3,600 for children under the age of six. And they raised the age limit from 16 to 17. The plan also made more people eligible and increased the total credit to $4,000 for one qualifying individual and $8,000 for two more. Oh, remember the unemployment insurance? Republicans, remember Lindsey Graham? They stopped, they stopped increasing uh, unemployment insurance in South Carolina. The American Rescue Plan extended unemployment benefits 
until September 6th with a weekly supplement benefit of $300 on top of the regular $400. And the first $10,200 of unemployment benefits were tax-free for people with incomes less than $150,000. Kadita, the last point is this here. John Hope Bryant was on our show. He also reminded people the earned income tax credit is retroactive. So if you forgot to actually get it, you can go back and get it applied to your taxes. None of that happened because of Republicans. So for the folk who say, man, our pockets have been empty with Biden, y'all didn't forget, y- y'all sure wasn't hell complain about that money. Absolutely, they were not. And there's so much more that this administration has done. If you think about the last 30 years, this administration has helped to put forward more black entrepreneurs than any other administration in the last three decades. Um, you know, there's 2.6 million more jobs for black folks in this time. Uh, and so if we are trying to actually, as a previous speaker mentioned, this is voting is a business decision. This is absolutely a business decision for you and your family. And if you are trying to put more money in your pockets and not allow for your tax dollars to go to the rich, and those who are highly favored by the Republican Party, then you need to make sure that you are casting your ballot this November or before if you can do that. Um, I'm a, this is the last round of question, uh, questions and answers before uh, I got to go to my final guest. And, and I'll, I'll, so, Jolanda, I'm going to go to you first. Um, we're talking about black turnout. 1983, 85% of all eligible black people voted for Harold Washington to become the first black mayor of Chicago. The white racists in Chicago supported the Republican candidate in a hardcore Democratic city because they didn't want to see a black man win. If 85% of all eligible black people voted, I don't know who the hell the other 15% were, if they, he doesn't become mayor unless they vote. Andrew Young said at the Alpha Public Program last year at the convention in Dallas that I moderated the conversation, when he ran for Congress, and it was in 72 or 74, he got 72% of all eligible black people who were registered to vote, voted. The facts are clear. If black people vote at at least, at least 65, at least 65, but let's say 70. If we vote 65 to 70 percent of our capacity, we can sweep elections. Because if they're going to be voting here, and we vote here, that additional 20, 30, 50, 75, 100 thousand votes, that's the difference between winning and losing. And so, literally. The power is in the hands of black people. Somebody on Twitter like uh, got mags. I said yesterday, I, don't, I said, I don't care what white folks going to do, Latinos going to do, white women going to do. What I'm saying to black people, if we literally use that ballot and vote our capacity, we can sweep races, whoever we want to win. Absolutely here, black people are the Democrats that determine who, who wins. So they determine which white person wins and which Hispanic person wins. People just don't understand that. And as I've said before, the world is run by those who show up. So it could be a city with a million people. If, I've, if 500 people show up, then the majority of those people are gonna decide what happens to us with the million. And there's a reason why they are, the powers that be, Donald Trump's of the world, are suppressing our vote. And I will say this is black people. You hear people talking about all the time trying to get black people the right to vote if they lose it when they get elected. Here in, I mean, uh, here in Texas, if you are a convicted felon like Donald Trump, you literally do not have the right to vote. And if you are on paper, you do not have the right to vote. So in Texas, Donald Trump, if he lived in Texas, couldn't even vote for himself. And then you can't get a job. You can't get an apartment. You don't qualify for certain things. I don't think that we should let Donald Trump be able to do what we can't do. If we go to apply for a job and we have a felony on our record, if we go apply for an apartment and we have a felony on our record, we don't get stuff. So we need to try to do to Donald Trump what the system does to us because that is what it was designed to do. But black people, we have the power. But I'm gonna say this again, Roland, we've got to 
connects for people. Yes. People just don't know. They, they don't know Absolutely. that government are the ones who put the sidewalk around Kelly Courts, you know, in Houston, which is a north side Section 8 place. They don't understand that, that they put that they put lights in Law Park in Sunnyside where they were dumping dead bodies and crime was taking place. They don't understand that. They don't understand like your parents did in Clinton Park. But I will tell you, politicians pay attention to two things. The first thing they pay attention to is people with money. Most of us don't have money like that. The second thing they pay attention to is what you said, Roland, and the other gentleman said, they pay attention to people who are organized and who vote. And guess what? So, Votes trumps money. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, you know what? You're right. You know what? Because I, I will right. say this. People can tr contribute a lot to your campaign, but they can't vote for you. And I was literally right. talking to Representative Allen and we're both representatives and we're talking about people that had a whole bunch of money like more money than us and you know what we do i literally went to isaac elementary school yesterday i was the only elected official that showed up myself because they want extracurricular activities they want a performing arts center and they were so thankful that i showed up and that i listened to what they want and i told them i will try to help you get this performing arts center yep that's what we have to do so now they've connected this is a legacy show to, oh, we can get a performing arts center and we can learn ballet. There you go. Very simple things, right? And, and there that's you what go. we got to do. And for everybody who's watching in Texas, before the Jalanda go, go to my iPad, Henry. Yeah. Folks, Texas has the largest number of eligible black voters in America at 2.9 million. Mm -hmm. 2.9 million. That's eligible black voters. I didn't say black population. That's eligible right. black voters. So folks, if you do the math, if you do the math, and you talk about if you have 70% uh, of black people in Texas, that's two million votes alone. 2.9. No, 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 that's 2.9 million. I said, but if we vote at 70% of our capacity, Okay. Yeah. Now, okay. Here, so now, now here's the whole deal, y'all. Here's, here's, here's the whole deal. Let me see here. Ted Cruz. Who, who, uh, Beto, Beto ran against, uh, Cruz. Ted Cruz. And he ran yeah. against Abbott as well. Yeah, Ted mm -hmm. Cruz beats Beto. I just want to see the vote total. Hold on one second. Vote total. So right here, the, the vote total was Cruz 4.2 million, Beto 4 million. If we voted at 7% of our capacity, we alone deliver half of the votes needed to win. But guess what? Makes it harder if we vote at 30%. Mm -hmm. 40%. That's how the game changes. Representative Jelana Jones, I appreciate it. Michael, your final comment. Um, you know, this is a fantastic conversation. You talked about the American Rescue Plan, rolling two quick things. Number one, no Republicans in the House or the Senate voted for the American Rescue Plan. We have to drive home that point. The only reason why that got passed is because of Democrats. One, two, uh, Vice President Kamala Harris was the top breaking vote in this. It was 50-50. She was the top breaking vote. So all these people out here saying Vice President Kamala Harris hasn't done anything. The reason why you got those $1,400 stimulus checks plus was because of that black woman. Call it whatever you want to, but that's why you got them. And uh, you're at WhiteHouse.gov, Roland. Fantastic website. Everybody look at, and Roland, if you could bring this up quickly, the Biden-Harris administration advances equity and opportunity for black Americans and communities across the country. I refer to that oftentimes. That's a 36-page document at whitehouse.gov that breaks down category by category how the policies of the Biden-Harris administration are helping the African-American community. Republicans overwhelmingly voted against these policies or, uh, or are against them and will reverse them if they get back control of the White House, the Senate, and uh, keep control of the House of Representatives. Elections have consequences. Michael, we appreciate it. Thanks a lot, Niambi.
No, I was going to say, you know, you were talking about um, what black people voted at the capacity can do. I mean, we see Wes Moore in Maryland, right? I mean, he's the only black governor currently serving. Maryland, one in three voters in the state of Maryland is black, right? And it was because 80 percent of the black vote said that they were going to turn us more and did because only about half of white voters were going to turn out for him. So it actually does matter. And it particularly matters at the margins. Like when you show in Texas, you're talking about a few hundred thousand votes, which seems like a lot, but it's really not. So we're not talking about massive blowouts in a lot of these cases. We're talking about thousands of votes, in some cases, handfuls, as we saw in the presidential election. So, I mean, I think part of the um, issue we have, again, I go back to Jesse Jackson, is that you had people not mobilized and people who were left kind of out of the equation. And then when you looked up, it's like, we need those people. We waited too late. And then the election is over. Uh, absolutely. Well, appreciate it. Um, let me uh, now uh, go to, uh, let's see here, um, Kanita. A lot of election deniers that are currently sitting in our state legislatures. And that is something that we should all be considering in this moment. I look at the black vote here in Pennsylvania in 2022 and the rate in which we showed up to the polls ensured that we have our first black woman speaker of the house in our state legislature. Also sure we have a black man as our lieutenant governor. And so the power of the black vote can do incredible things if we come out in record numbers. Uh, in Pennsylvania, we need to come out at the 70% number that you mentioned, Roland, we were 67% in 2020. And so we need to uh, make sure that we vote at more record numbers here and the youth must come out and cast a ballot. And unfortunately, if you have four grandchildren, the likelihood is only one of those four are registered to vote. So let's get the children involved. Let's get the young folks involved and let's get everybody to the polls. Uh, absolutely. Closes out, Gary. You know, I live in the 50th ranked state in the nation and it is the second blackest state in America. When I ran for Congress, 18 percent of the population showed up in the second uh, congressional district here in Louisiana, which at the time was the only black congressional district. Because black folks thought we're going to get a second black congressional district rooted out of Baton Rouge, which gives us another seat in Congress for somebody to go and fight for millions of dollars for the people of Louisiana. Uh, there are other states that are getting more representation. That is going to be transformative for your community only if you vote, though. It doesn't happen because of osmosis. It doesn't happen because we hope it, it gets better, because we pray it gets better. Faith without works is dead, and faith ain't foolish. If you ain't getting off your tail and go do something, it's not going to happen. And for those of us who sacrifice from our families and go out there and do this work every day, you spit in our faces when you tell us you're not going to vote, because we sacrifice every day and go out here and do this work. And so if you appreciate the work that I do, if you appreciate the work that Roland does, if you appreciate the voices that you've heard and the things that we are consistent doing to advocate, don't spit in our face and tell us that you're not going to participate because too many of us are out here every day doing things we don't have to do on your behalf for all of us. And all you got to do is go around the corner and cast the ballot. Do your part so that we can all do better. Um, absolutely. Uh, so just trying to let folk know, uh, again, let me be very clear. What everybody here has said, this ain't about a party. This is not about an individual. This is not about who I'm in love with. This is not about somebody that excites me. This is not about somebody that gets me energized. This is about us. When you cast a ballot, you ain't just voting for you. You voting for your sons and daughters, your nieces and your nephews, your cousins, your aunts and your uncles, your mama and your daddy, your grandparents, your friends, sorority sisters, fraternity brothers, church members. That's who you voting for. This is not a moment. And we've had now four consecutive elections, actually five. We can go back to every election since 2012 and we have seen the black turnout drop. We've seen it drop. We see the numbers where voters 65 and older who are black, they say, oh, we voting. We see voters 55 to 50, uh, 64 saying, yeah, we gonna vote. But then when you go below 54, eh, I don't know. Eh, I don't know. I'm gonna stay on the couch. Yeah, I ain't feeling it. Yeah, you know, he too old. Yeah, I don't know. Niambe said it. Somebody going to win. You, you can come up with every excuse you want to 
about the election, but let's be real clear. Somebody is going to be the president and the United States senator from your state and the congressional member from your district and the governor from your state and the state senator and the state rep and the mayor and the city council member and the district attorney and the judge and the tax assessor. Somebody's going to win. And if you choose to sit at home, not a problem. I can guarantee you there's somebody else who's like, ooh, yes, them black folks, they sitting their asses at home. Oh, yes, we could win everything because they ain't voting. And let me remind y'all, in 2016, who thanked black people for not voting? Not for voting. Donald Trump did not thank black people for voting for him. He thanked black people for not voting in the election. And what he was saying is, you fools help me win. Question is, do y'all want to help him win in November by sitting your ass at home? It's really up to you. COVID happened, poor people were dying at a rate already of 800 people a day before COVID. If you went to a funeral every single day, it would take you 600 years to attend all the funerals of the people who will die from the ravages of policy violence, poverty, and low wages in America in just one year. It would take you two years and 19 days to go to all of the funerals of the people that will die today and oftentimes Silence. Nobody talks about this political genocide. But we are determined today to remember their death and be a resurrection of voting power and voice power like never before. Economic justice and saving this democracy are deeply connected. We, as a nation, must listen to the demands of the poor who are pushing and will continue to push political candidates and elected leaders to lift from the bottom so that everybody can rise. We are the poor, the marginalized, and the underpaid. And we are taking one step forward to say that everybody has a right to live. Poverty is not the fault of those who are impoverished. It is caused by those who make the policy. There are over 135 million poor and low-wage, low-income people in this nation. The biggest block of potential voters by far is low-income, low-wage voters. I can't afford medicine. Sometimes I have to skip because of the cost. The farm worker community is tired of the violence imposed upon us by greed, exclusion, and denial of basic human rights. Those folk that represented by that casket, poor and low-wage workers who are the most moral people in this country because they go to work every day believing, even though going to work is hazardous to their health. I'm tired of working 70 to 80 hours a week and still not have money for the necessity of bills. I'm tired of getting sick and not being able to go see the doctor. Having to make a choice to pay between rent or the light bill or food or clothes. You cannot claim to care about families and a culture of life and then do everything in your power to rob people of equal access to resources and to force them to live in poverty. Leadership of both parties that waged war on poor people and low wage workers. And this government has treated people experiencing poverty, including their military families, with disdainful, deliberate, malicious neglect. So the truth is that my son died from poverty. We refuse to accept poverty as the fourth leading cause of death. The fourth leading cause of death in this, the richest country in the world. We march today for our children and the generations to come. And we need to do it with the loudest voices possible, the biggest actions possible. We will voice our demands and register our vote. When we stand up, 
And when we stand together, things change. There is the electorate that is, and then there is the electorate that should be. 34 million eligible poor and low income voters did not vote in 2016. If just 20% of those voters in swing state were mobilized around an agenda, they could change the political outcome of every election. So we're launching the most massive voter mobilization and turnout campaign in history of poor and low wage voters, allies, and religious leaders. People are dying, but we know it doesn't have to be this way. And so we are calling on everyone to join us in this Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival. We are here, we will be seen, we will be heard, and our power will be felt. We don't need to be an insurrection. We are a resurrection that will be felt across this country. Are you ready? 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 We are a resurrection, and we are ready. And